You're listening to Morning Short, the podcast that brings you one great short story every morning. Available on listen.morningshort.com, iTunes, SoundCloud, and any podcast app. Today's story is Little Annie's Ramble by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Before we start, I have a question for you. Have you tweeted your personal invite link to Morning Short yet? Share great stories and earn Morning Short prizes. Get your link at share.morningshort.com. And now, to the story. Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong. The town crier has rung his bell at a distant corner, and little Annie stands on her father's doorsteps trying to hear what the man with the loud voice is talking about. Let me listen too. Oh, He is telling the people that an elephant and a lion and a royal tiger and a horse with horns and other strange beasts from foreign countries have come to town and will receive all visitors who choose to wait upon them. Perhaps little Annie would like to go. Yes, and I can see that the pretty child is weary of this wide and pleasant street with the green trees flinging their shade across the quiet sunshine and the pavements and the sidewalks all as clean as if the housemaid had just swept them with her broom. She feels that impulse to go strolling away, that longing after the mystery of the great world, which many children feel, and which I felt in my childhood. Little Annie shall take a ramble with me, see? I do but hold out my hand, and like some bright bird in the sunny air, with her blue silk frock fluttering upward from her white pantalets, She comes bounding on tiptoe across the street. Smooth back your brown curls, Annie, and let me tie on your bonnet, and we will set forth. What a strange couple to go on their rambles together. One walks in black attire with a measured step and a heavy brow and his thoughtful eyes bent down, while the gay little girl trips lightly along as if she were forced to keep hold of my hand, lest her feet should dance away from the earth. Yet there is sympathy between us. If I pride myself on anything, it is because I have a smile that children love, and on the other hand, there are few grown ladies that could entice me from the side of little Annie, for I delight to let my mind go hand in hand with the mind of a sinless child. So come, Annie, but if I moralize as we go, do not listen to me, only look about you and be merry. Now we turn the corner. Here are hacks with two horses and stagecoaches with four thundering to meet each other, and trucks and carts moving at a slower pace, being heavily laden with barrels from the wharves. And here are rattling gigs which perhaps will be smashed to pieces before our eyes. Hitherward also comes a man trundling a wheelbarrow along the pavement. Is not little Annie afraid of such a tumult? No. She does not even shrink closer to my side, but passes on with fearless confidence, a happy child amidst a great throng of grown people who pay the same reverence to her infancy that they would to extreme old age. Nobody jostles her. I'll turn aside to make way for little Annie. And, what is most singular, she appears conscious of her claim to such respect. Now her eyes brighten with pleasure, A street musician has seated himself on the steps of yonder church and pours forth his strains to the busy town, a melody that has gone astray among the tramp of footsteps, the buzz of voices and the war of passing wheels. Who heeds the poor organ grinder? None but myself and little Annie, whose feet begin to move in unison with the lively tune, as if she were loath that music should be wasted without a dance. But where would Annie find a partner? Some have the gout in their toes, or the rheumatism in their joints. Some are stiff with age, some feeble with disease. Some are so lean that their bones would rattle, and others of such ponderous size that their agility would crack the flagstones. But many, many have leaden feet because their hearts are far heavier than lead. It is a sad thought that I have chanced upon. What a company of dancers should we be! For I, too, am a gentleman of sober footsteps, and therefore, little Annie, let us walk sedately on. It is a question with me whether this giddy child or my sage self have most pleasure in looking at the shop windows, 
We love the silks of sunny hue that glow within the darkened premises of the spruce dry goods men. We are pleasantly dazzled by the burnished silver and the chaste gold, the rings of wedlock and the costly love ornaments glistening at the window of the jeweler. But Annie, more than I, seeks for a glimpse of her passing figure in the dusty looking glasses at the hardware stores. All that is bright and gay attracts us both. Here is a shop to which the recollections of my boyhood as well as present partialities give a peculiar magic. How delightful to let the fancy revel on the dainties of a confectioner. Those pies with such white and flaky paste, their contents being a mystery. Whether rich mints with whole plums intermixed, or piquant apple, delicately rose-flavored, those cakes heart-shaped or round, piled in a lofty pyramid, those sweet little circlets sweetly named kisses, those dark majestic masses fit to be bridal loaves at the wedding of an heiress. Mountains in size, their summits deeply snow-covered with sugar. Then the mighty treasures of sugar plums, white and crimson and yellow, in large glass vases, and candy of all varieties, and those little cockles, or whatever they are called, much prized by children for their sweetness, and more for the mottos which they enclose by lovesick maids and bachelors. Oh, my mouth waters, little Annie, and so doth yours, but we will not be tempted except to an imaginary feast, so let us hasten onward, devouring the vision of a plum cake. Here are pleasures, as some people would say, of a more exalted kind in the window of a bookseller, is Annie a literary lady? Yes, she is deeply read in Peter Parley's tomes and has an increasing love for fairy tales, though seldom met with nowadays, and she will subscribe next year to the juvenile miscellany. But truth to tell, she is apt to turn away from the printed page and keep gazing at the pretty pictures, such as the gay-colored ones which make this shop window the continual loitering place of children. What would Annie think if, in the book which I mean to send her on New Year's Day, she should find her sweet little self bound up in silk or morocco with gilt edges, there to remain till she became a woman grown with children of her own to read about their mother's childhood? That would be very queer. Little Annie is weary of pictures and pulls me onward by the hand, till suddenly we pause at the most wondrous shop in all the town, Oh, my stars, is this a toy shop or is it fairyland? For here are gilded chariots in which the king and queen of the fairies might ride side by side, while their courtiers on these small horses should gallop in triumphal procession before and behind the royal pair. Here, too, are dishes of chinaware fit to be the dining set of those same princely personages when they make a regal banquet in the stateliest hall of their palace, full five feet high, and behold their nobles feasting adown the long perspective of the table. Betwixt the king and queen should sit my little Annie, the prettiest fairy of them all. Here stands a turbaned Turk threatening us with his saber, like an ugly heathen as he is, and next a Chinese Mandarin who nods his head at Annie and myself. Here we may review a whole army of horse and foot in red and blue uniforms, with drums, fifes, trumpets, and all kinds of noiseless music. They have halted on the shelf of this window after their weary march from Lilliput. But what cares Annie for soldiers? No conquering queen is she, neither a Semiramis nor a Catherine. Her whole heart is set upon that doll who gazes at us with such a fashionable stare. This is the little girl's true plaything. Though made of wood, a doll is a visionary and ethereal personage, endowed by childish fancy with a peculiar life. The mimic lady is a heroine of romance, an actor and a sufferer in a thousand shadowy scenes the chief inhabitant of that wild world with which children ape the real one. Little Annie does not understand what I am saying, but looks wishfully at the proud lady in the window. We will invite her home with us as we return. Meantime, goodbye, Dame Doll. A toy yourself, you look forth from your window upon many ladies that are also toys, though they walk and speak 
and upon a crowd in pursuit of toys, though they wear grave visages. Oh, with your never-closing eyes, had you but an intellect to moralize on all that flits before them, what a wise doll you would be. Come, little Annie, we shall find toys enough, go where we may. Now we elbow our way among the throng again. It is curious in the most crowded part of a town to meet with living creatures that had their birthplace in some far solitude, but have acquired a second nature in the wilderness of men. Look up, Annie, at that canary bird hanging out of the window in his cage. Poor little fellow, his golden feathers are all tarnished in the smoky sunshine. He would have glistened twice as brightly among the summer islands, but still he has become a citizen in all his tastes and habits, and would not sing half so well without the uproar that drowns his music. What a pity that he does not know how miserable he is. There is a parrot, too, calling out, Pretty Paul, pretty Paul, as we pass by. Foolish bird to be talking about her prettiness to strangers, especially as she is not a pretty Paul, though gaudily dressed in green and yellow. If she had said, Pretty Annie, there would have been some sense in it. See that gray squirrel at the door of the fruit shop whirling round and round so merrily within his wire wheel, being condemned to the treadmill he makes it an amusement. Admirable philosophy. Here comes a big rough dog, a countryman's dog, in search of his master, smelling at everybody's heels and touching little Annie's hand with his cold nose, but hurrying away, though she would fain have patted him. Success to your search, fidelity! And there sits a great yellow cat upon a window sill, a very corpulent and comfortable cat, gazing at this transitory world with owl's eyes and making pithy comments. Doubtless, or what appear such to the silly beast, O oh, sage puss, make room for me beside you, and we will be a pair of philosophers. Here we see something to remind us of the town crier and his ding-dong bell. Look, look at that great cloth spread out in the air, pictured all over with wild beasts as if they had met together to choose a king according to their custom in the days of Aesop. But they are choosing neither a king nor a president, else we should hear a most horrible snarling. They have come from the deep woods and the wild mountains and the desert sands and the polar snows only to do homage to my little Annie. As we enter among them, the great elephant makes us a bow in the best style of elephantine courtesy, bending lowly down his mountain bulk, with trunk abased and leg thrust out behind. And he returns the salute, much to the gratification of the elephant, who was certainly the best-bred monster in the caravan. The lion and the lioness are busy with two beef bones. The royal tiger, the beautiful, the untamable, keeps pacing his narrow cage with a haughty step, unmindful of the spectators or recalling the fierce deeds of his former life, when he was wont to leap forth upon such inferior animals from the jungles of Bengal. Here we see the very same wolf. Do not go near him, Annie! The self-same wolf that devoured little Red Riding Hood and her grandmother. In the next cage, a hyena from Egypt who has doubtless howled around the pyramids and a black bear from our own forests, our fellow prisoners and most excellent friends. Are there any two living creatures who have so few sympathies that they cannot possibly be friends? Here sits a great white bear whom common observers would call a very stupid beast, though I perceive him to be only absorbed in contemplation. He is thinking of his voyages on an iceberg and of his comfortable home in the vicinity of the North Pole, and of the little cubs whom he left rolling in the eternal snows. In fact, he is a bear of sentiment. But oh, those unsentimental monkeys, the ugly, grinning, aping, chattering, ill-natured, mischievous, and queer little brutes. Annie does not love the monkeys. Their ugliness shocks her pure instinctive delicacy of taste and makes her mind unquiet because it bears a wild and dark resemblance to humanity. But here is a little pony just big enough for Annie to ride, and round and round he gallops in a circle, keeping time with his trampling hooves and a band of music. And here, 
with a laced coat and a cocked hat and a riding whip in his hand. Here comes a little gentleman small enough to be king of the fairies and ugly enough to be king of the gnomes, and takes a flying leap into the saddle, merrily, merrily plays the music and merrily gallops the pony and merrily rides the little old gentleman. Come, Annie, into the street again. Perchance we may see monkeys on horseback there. Mercy on us! What a noisy world we quiet people live in! Did Annie ever read the cries of London City? With what lusty lungs doth yonder man proclaim that his wheelbarrow is full of lobsters? Here comes another, mounted on a cart and blowing a horse and dreadful blast from a tin horn, as much as to say, Fresh fish! And hark! A voice on high! like that of a muezzin from the summit of a mosque, announcing that some chimney sweeper has emerged from smoke and soot and darksome caverns into the upper air. What cares the world for that? But well a day, we hear a shrill voice of affliction, the scream of a little child rising louder with every repetition of that smart, sharp, slapping sound produced by an open hand on tender flesh. Andy sympathizes, though without experience of such direful woe. Lo, the town crier again, with some new secret for the public ear. Will he tell us of an auction, or of a lost pocketbook, or a show of beautiful wax figures, or of some monstrous beast more horrible than any in the caravan? I guess the latter. See how he uplifts the bell in his right hand and shakes it slowly at first, then with a hurried motion, till the clapper seems to strike both sides at once and the sounds are scattered forth in quick succession far and near. Ding dong, ding dong, ding dong! Now he raises his clear, loud voice above all the din of the town. It drowns the buzzing talk of many tongues and draws each man's mind from his own business. It rolls up and down the echoing street and ascends to the hushed chamber of the sick and penetrates downward to the cellar kitchen where the hot cook turns from the fire to listen. Who of all that addressed the public ear, whether in church or courthouse or hall of state, has such an attentive audience as the town crier? What saith the people's orator? Strayed from her home, a little girl of five years old, in a blue silk frock and white pantalettes, with brown curling hair and hazel eyes. Whoever will bring her back to her afflicted mother— Stop, stop, town crier, the lost is found. Oh, my pretty Annie, we forgot to tell your mother of our ramble, and she is in despair and has sent the town crier to bellow up and down the streets, a frightening old and young for the loss of a little girl who has not once let go my hand. Well, let us hasten homeward, and as we go, forget not to thank heaven, my Annie, that after wandering a little way into the world, you may return at the first summons with an untainted and unwearied heart and be a happy child again. But I have gone too far astray for the town crier to call me back. Sweet has been the charm of childhood on my spirit throughout my ramble with little Annie. Say not that it has been a waste of precious moments, an idle matter, a babble of childish talk and a reverie of childish imaginations about topics unworthy of a grown man's notice. Has it been merely this? Not so, not so. They are not truly wise who would affirm it. As the pure breath of children revives the life of aged men, so is our moral nature revived by their free and simple thoughts, their native feeling, their airy mirth for little cause or none their grief soon roused and soon allayed. Their influence on us is at least reciprocal with ours on them. When our infancy is almost forgotten and our boyhood long departed, though it seems but as yesterday when life settles darkly down upon us and we doubt whether to call ourselves young any more, then it is good to steal away from the society of bearded men and even of gentler women and spend an hour or two with children, After drinking from those fountains of still fresh existence, we shall return into the crowd, as I do now, to struggle onward and do our part in life, perhaps as fervently as ever, but for a time with a kinder and purer heart and a spirit more lightly wise. All this by thy sweet magic, dear little Annie. Before your next story, 
Rate us five stars on iTunes. We count on your tweets and reviews to help us bring our stories to the largest number of readers possible. Visit share.morningshort.com to invite your family and friends to listen to stories from Morning Short. Learn more about the Morning Short Project and sign up for our daily emails at morningshort.com.